Avatar The Last Airbender is one of those iconic shows that gets you imagining just how incredible it would be to do something that is otherwise an everyday occurrence in another world. A show that I was captivated by every time I watched it, from just how connected its story makes you feel to the characters, their journeys, and struggles, that even manages to charge its battles with so much emotion, and as unbelievable as shooting fire out of your hands in the most flashy way possible looks, many things we see happen in the show are indeed backed by real world science, so while none of us were suddenly start blasting fire from our feet, we can still take a fantasy dive into how firebending actually works based on what we see happen on the show. A question that I admittedly went through once before, but I'm now going into in much greater detail. Avatar The Last Airbender, however strange, manages to follow scientific principles of things like human anatomy, with its many demonstrations and battles giving us important clues to how firebending works, with what is possibly the biggest piece of evidence being that firebenders are shown to only be able to shoot fire out of their hands, feet, and sometimes mouth. An obvious yet amazing detail, because the surfaces of our human bodies that are uniquely made to exchange cold and heat with the environment are the palms of our hands, the bottoms of our feet, and our faces. That's because unlike anywhere else on the body, these areas contain a very special type of skin. You see, all mammals have two types of skin, being a thin or hairy skin that is found on most surfaces of the body, and then a special thick skin called glabrous skin, with glabrous defining as being smooth and even. That within it contains a unique arrangement of vasculature, being our arteries, veins, and capillaries that move blood around in the body. Most areas of the body follow a rule of blood always moving from your arteries to your capillaries and then to your veins. Glabrous skin areas, however, break this rule, with what are known as AVAs, being arteriovenous astomoses, meaning that the arteries and these areas can interact directly with the veins. And while you don't have to remember all the science behind this, what's important to know here is that unlike the rest of our body, this means that these areas are able to easily dump heat from our bodies into the surrounding environment, allowing us to rapidly cool down or sometimes heat up our core body temperature. This science also explains why the average firebender is only ever seen shooting basic fire blasts out of these two surfaces, rather than their mouth like more advanced firebenders because while the palms and feet are typically loaded with glabrous skin, the face typically contains a lot less glabrous skin, and thus less of these specialized connections, typically being confined to more central areas like our cheekbones as well as our foreheads, seeing how the rest of the face can grow hair being made up of thin or hairy skin. And it's here that the firebending and its skill progressions that we see in Avatar once again coincide with real-world science. As in the show, we only ever see master level or special trained firebenders manage to shoot fire from their face, i.e. Combustion Man, a firebender assassin for hire who, like only one other character to ever be seen in the show, is able to release fire from the little vasculature he contains within his forehead, releasing it into a highly concentrated blast. However, this doesn't cast aside the fact that we sweat all over our bodies by releasing water onto our skin that evaporates as another way to cool ourselves off, but rather these glabrous portals on our our hands and feet are just an absolutely incredible way for us to rapidly dump heat. But then we see something entirely different from more powerful firebenders such as Iroh and Fire Lord Ozai, who are considered strong enough that they are able to create and shoot fire directly from their mouths. And this is where things take a turn. You see, most mammals other than humans, like dogs, cats, even birds and reptiles, I'm looking at you dragons, primarily release the heat from their bodies not through these glabrous skin portals, but rather Rather, they get rid of heat via a process known as panting. Panting is essentially when an animal dumps heat from their body by evaporating water released through the membranes of their mouth, nose, and also lungs. And similar to humans, dogs are able to release heat through their paws, but it's very little. Hence why they have to pant to get rid of all the heat through their mouths. Reptiles, and let's just say it, dragons on the other hand, have hard scaly skin that acts as a great way for them to retain water and keep themselves cool in heat, but even they too too have to sometimes open up their mouths so they can evaporate the heat inside their bodies via panting, hence why dragons breathe and sometimes snort fire, but never shoot it out of their hands like humans do. Well, firebenders primarily don't release fire from their mouths, but rather their hands and feet. Likewise, humans, while being able to easily dump heat through their hands and feet, are also able to pant to release heat, given that we don't necessarily need to nearly as much as other animals. So if you've ever ran around for a long time, exhausted 
exhausted yourself hitting a punching bag or just walked around through a searing heat, you've probably found yourself breathing heavily, which, while giving you some more of that precious oxygen, also allowed you to release heat via panting. So, looking at Iroh's Dragon of the West demonstration, or Ozai's roar right before he fights Aang, we can assume that unlike most other firebenders who, one, don't come from as nearly as strong of a firebender bloodline as the powerful royal bloodline that they do, and two, don't have near the training and experience, Ozai and Iroh are both strong and skilled enough to release and control the heat coming from the many membranes inside their mouths, releasing it as fire. But if firebenders are capable of producing and releasing fire out of these specialized heat passageways, how exactly is it that they are able to continually produce fire over any length of time? I mean, you only have so much core body temperature to get rid of before you're too cold to move and your organs begin shutting down from hyperthermia, let alone continue to throw fire at the escaping avatar. So being the only benders that are able to generate their own element, how are firebenders able to continue to produce fire without endangering themselves? And it's this question that points us right at the overarching lore of the show. In Avatar, the waterbenders are said to draw their power from the moon, as seen in the end of the first season, where the moon's spirit is killed and waterbenders lose their powers to bend entirely, while firebenders, on the other hand, are said to draw their power from the sun. While the temporary death of the moon's spirit firmly cements the large spiritual connection that exists between benders and the spirit world, there also exists a scientifically explainable connection between these celestial bodies and the benders that rely on them. Specifically, the sun acts as a sort of battery for firebenders to rely on, and not just their own body heat, but rather a process called solar radiation that the sun emits. You see, solar radiation is a general term for what is really the electromagnetic radiation that emits specifically by the sun. Electromagnetic radiation is a form of energy that travels at the speed of light, as both electrical and magnetic waves and energy packets called photons. Now before I go too far just stuffing science down your throat in this remastered series, the only important thing to remember here is that unlike the moon, the sun gives off energy. Energy that is also able to reflect off of the moon towards the earth at night, given that it's not much. And it's this energy, this heat energy, that firebenders are able to absorb, primarily through, what do you know, the glabrous skin on their face, hands, and feet, as well as some through the rest of their bodies that they are then able to take in and release without sacrificing their own core body temperature too much. And this explains many aspects that we see, such as firebenders being much stronger in the daytime when the sun is up, as they have its solar radiation to rely on, while at night they are much weaker, having to rely off of what heat they can generate from their own core to produce any fire. And man, they would burn through so many calories to keep up their own internal body temperature as they fight through the night. This also explains the overarching plot of the show, where Aang, the new avatar, being found frozen in the Southern Water Tribe after disappearing for the last 100 years, has effectively one year to master all four elements and stop the Fire Nation from conquering the rest of the planet. All because in one year's time, a solar comet will return to the Earth's orbit, granting firebenders unspeakable amounts of power. And it's this comet, named Sozin's Comet, after the Fire Lord who began the war by using its power, that shows us that firebenders are actually much more sensitive than we might think, both on the feeling side and the absorption side, due to the fact that comets being made up of rock and ice, rather than emitting their own solar radiation, instead heat up dramatically due to capturing heat from the sun, with solar comets like Sozin's Comet making a hundred year round trip around the sun, massively heating it up until it goes back by the earth. And boy does this thing get close. And this gives us huge information about how firebending works in the show. That firebenders are actually able to absorb the heat radiating off of any nearby heat source. And the comet makes them exponentially more powerful than usual because the heat radiating off from a sun grazing comet like Sozin's is astronomically higher than any nearby torch. But it doesn't end here because another aspect of the show that tips us off to how firebending scientifically works is what happens to firebenders when they're faced with extreme cold. Through the series, we see firebenders like Zuko encounter situations where he is placed in a freezing sub-zero environment and has to keep himself warm or risk temporarily losing his ability to bend or his life, because walking up a freezing waterfall and swimming through a frozen lake is no joke. So what is actually happening here specifically? Well, since we know that firebenders 
rely on the Glabra skin portals on their appendages to expel fire, the fact that they lose their ability to bend when placed in extreme cold makes perfect sense. This is because in order to preserve your internal body temperature, when placed in a cold environment, the arteries and veins within areas such as your face, hands, and feet rapidly constrict, lowering the blood supply to them and shutting off any heat that might be lost from the body to the surrounding environment. And it's this constriction based off of the need to preserve internal heat for basic survival that temporarily immobilizes firebenders. But there's ways for firebenders to get around this. In Book 1's finale titled Siege of the North, we see Zuko leave Iroh and set out to finally capture Aang who has currently meditated himself into the spirit world. Iroh tells Zuko to remember to use his Breath of Fire, a technique where Zuko is able to use firebending to regulate and even heat up his own internal body temperature to keep himself warm, even in the coldest environments. One interesting thing to note, however, is that based off of these heating and cooling studies done at Stanford that saw athletes being able to nearly double their work output after cooling themselves down through these special portals, Zuko could have also just as easily kept these special areas on his hands and feet warm to preserve his temperature as they directly connect to his core, rather than focusing on heating up the areas of his body around his core. But when you can literally breathe fire, it may not matter as much. So now for one of the elephants in the room. What about a solar eclipse? You know, the thing that happens when the moon completely blocks out the sun and firebenders can't bend at all? Well, this one is a bit weird. Namely because firebenders are still able to bend just fine, be it less powerful after the sun goes down, and the earth itself is standing between them and the sun. How is a solar eclipse any different than nighttime? One simple explanation for this could be the fact that even though the sun has gone down, the sun's solar radiation is still able to bounce off of the moon. But this still doesn't answer the question of why they lose their ability to bend completely when it's blocked, despite the fact that they can also bend when indoors and underground. Other than being a possible plot hole that contradicts how bending works, it seems to be that it is happening for two reasons. One being because the moon specifically is the object now standing between firebenders and their source. Longtime fans of the show know that while air and earth are said to be natural opposites, the same thing is said about fire and water. And two, when the moon does block out the sun, this is the only time that none of the sun's solar radiation is able to reach the Earth. For what, like seven and a half minutes? Seems to do the trick. Tricks, much like Avatar's many martial art and acrobatic techniques, that inspired little old Trick to learn some for himself all those years ago. And you might be thinking, this is good and all, but what about lightning bending? The fact that some firebenders are able to go from expelling heat out of their fists to doing this is it's certainly a hard one to explain. We know from the show that lightning bending is said to occur when a firebender is able to successfully create two opposing positive and negative charges, and that the actual lightning itself occurs due to the imbalance between these two charges. And props to the show for sliding in how natural lightning works into its own fantasy world, because natural lightning itself isn't so different in that it's formed when the lighter positively charged particles build up at the top of a cloud, while at the same time the heavier negatively charged charged particles sink to the bottom of the cloud, essentially forming two opposing poles, creating its own electrical field. Over time, as the difference between these two poles grow, the electrons on the cloud's bottom actually repel the negatively charged electrons on the ground, giving the objects below a positive charge. Eventually, a strong enough of a connection is made, and the electrons shoot downwards from the clouds towards the positively charged ground. And this certainly has a few implications when it comes to the way we see firebenders, and perhaps all benders in general. We know firebenders are able to charge themselves and thus their bending by taking in the electromagnetic radiation coming from the sun, which showers the earth in the form of energetic photon particles, and photons are absorbed by electrons, which both raises their energy level, freeing them to move around, as well as are emitted by electrons, which has the opposite effect in lowering the electron's energy level. And it's this fact, coupled with everything we've learned so far about firebenders absorbing solar energy and being able to create two opposing charges at will that tells us that firebenders are able to control not just heat but the very photons themselves that comprise the solar or electromagnetic radiation they're taking in. That the important takeaway here is that advanced firebenders are really able to pump electrons into the area around one of their glabrous hands, namely their fingertips full of heat or photons while channeling the photons away from their other fingertips to create two separate charges. I will add that in reality what they 
would have to do for lightning to shoot outwards is to also create another area devoid of photons elsewhere in the environment for their now supercharged electrons to shoot towards to. But the show still gets pretty close in terms of what makes sense for its world based on real science. But hey, if none of this was very exciting, then I saved my most interesting detail for last. Firebenders are able to not only heat up their fire through the means described above, but most likely as a training tool, can also rapidly cool down their own flames without decreasing their size, thus creating a real-world phenomenon known as cold fire. Check out this video for more science of how one of the coolest animated shows works, and maybe hit the subscribe button so you don't miss the next remastered episode of the series. See you in the next one!